Pulitzer Prize winning composer John Luther Adams was born and raised in Mississippi. He studied musical composition in California in the 1970s and then he moved to Alaska where he lived for over three decades. His musical compositions often evoke natural landscapes and environmental soundscapes. John Luther Adams composed Nunatax for solo piano 10 years ago in 2007, inspired by the natural phenomenon of rocky mountain formations called Nunatax that rise up out of ice fields and glaciers. As Michael performs this work, you will hear 10 craggy peaks rising out of a barren musical landscape. The composer writes, the jagged contours of Nunatax contrast sharply with the smooth whiteness that surrounds them. As the ice melts and the sea rises, these solitary peaks stand as stark reminders of our own isolation and vulnerability.
The next two works on the program, both by Bach, have the word sonata in their titles. The word sonata comes from the Italian word sonare, to sound. Centuries ago, the term was used rather generically to describe pieces of instrumental music. By the late 17th century, composers used the term sonata more specifically to describe a genre of instrumental works with contrasting fast and slow sections. It wasn't until the late 18th century that the genre of the sonata was regularly associated with what musicians refer to as sonata form. All of this is to say that the concept and the conventions of the sonata changed dramatically over time. For example, by the 19th century, in violin sonatas by composers such as Johannes Brahms, the keyboardist is essentially an equal partner to the violinist. But in the 17th and 18th centuries in Bach's time, sonatas written for violin were typically accompanied by a keyboard playing continuo. Continuo is the term that we use to describe the keyboard's supportive role in these pieces. The keyboardist simply provides a harmonic backdrop, improvising chords that match the harmonic progression indicated in the score by the composer. Bach composed six sonatas for violin with harpsichord accompaniment. These pieces may have been played in the home or in more public context, perhaps at coffee house concerts. In Bach's violin sonatas, we can hear the harpsichord gradually start to break out of its role as continuo player, emerging here and there as an independent voice, at times even playing melodies along with the violin. Bach's sixth violin sonata is most unconventional, perhaps even experimental. Bach scholars have determined that he began work on the sixth violin sonata in the 1720s and then revised it at least twice over the next 20 years or so. The third version is unusual in that it has five movements and the middle movement is exceptional in that it was composed for harpsichord solo. The violinist doesn't play at all. This short movement is structured in a binary form which simply means that there are two sections of music and each of these sections repeats.
Bach composed the musical offering in 1747. It was one of the last major works that he composed before he died in 1750. The musical offering is not one big coherent musical work so much as a collection of instrumental pieces all based on a single musical theme, which was provided to Bach by Friedrich the Great of Prussia. The work is dedicated to the king. Today, we will hear not the entire musical offering, but one piece from this collection, a trio sonata, which is essentially a multi-movement sonata for three components. Two solo instruments plus continuo, played by harpsichord and cello. The two solo instruments, the violin and flute, play in the same register, but their instrumental colors contrast beautifully. As you listen to the performance, you will hear many moments of musical imitation and intertwining between the violin and the flute. Uh, let's now hear on the cello a demonstration of the musical offering's main theme, that melody that was provided to Bach by Friedrich the Great of Prussia. In the second movement of the trio sonata, you will hear this theme stated clearly by the continuo instruments, the cello and the harpsichord. But actually, Bach uses this theme to generate much of the musical material that we hear throughout the trio sonata and throughout all of the pieces that together constitute the musical offering.
Brahms's Opus 116 is a set of seven short pieces for solo piano. Brahms composed and published these pieces and a few other similar collections of short piano pieces towards the very end of his career in the 1890s. They are challenging, introspective, expressive pieces, a bit like songs without words. Like so much of Brahms's music, they appeal on multiple visceral and intellectual levels. They were accessible to amateur pianists and music lovers and intriguing to a growing audience of music connoisseurs and scholars. Brahms titled his Opus 116 collection Fantasies, and each of the seven pieces in the collection he titled either Capriccio, a generic term for a short, lively, freely structured piece, or Intermezzo, a term that implies connection. In opera, for example, an intermezzo is a term that might be used to label a brief musical interlude. The intermezzo that Michael will play now from Brahms's Opus 116 will serve as a short interlude within this recital, a diversion, a connection, an intermediary.
Brahms composed his Opus 91 songs for alto, viola, and piano for his friends, the violinist Josef jo Joachim, who also played the viola, and Amelie Schneeweiss, a singer. The alto range of the singer's voice matches the alto range of the string instrument, and we often hear these two voices in dialogue. The piano is not an active melodic participant, but provides accompaniment for the duet. Joachim and Schneeweiss had married in 1863, and Brahms dedicated the second of the two songs in the set, a lullaby, to their son, who was born in 1864 and named Johannes after Brahms himself. In the opening melody played by the viola, Brahms quotes the lullaby, Josef Lieber Josef, a tribute to Josef Joachim. The text of the poem Brahms sets refers to Mary rocking baby Jesus to sleep. I've been describing the second song in the set, which Brahms composed first. The text of the first song, which Brahms composed two decades later, in the mid-1880s, was again composed for Joachim and Schneeweiss. The text is a poem by Friedrich Rückert, a German poet and translator whose poetry was set by over a dozen German composers throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. The imagery of Rückert's poem, first published in 1816, is typical of poems set to music in the German art song tradition. Brahms' musical setting depicts some of the natural imagery described in the poem. The trees, the birds, the breezes, the distant hills and stars. It is also suffused with the musical language of longing.
Mozart composed this next piece of chamber music for an exquisite combination of instruments. We see here the flute, the oboe, viola, and cello, and an unusual keyboard instrument, the celeste. You may not recognize the instrument by sight, but the sound of the celeste may be familiar. Tchaikovsky, oh. Tchaikovsky wrote this famous part for the celeste into his score for the Nutcracker Ballet in 1892. At that time, the celeste was a brand new instrument, invented only half a dozen years before Tchaikovsky wrote for it. But Mozart wrote the piece you're about to hear 101 years earlier, in 1791, the year he died at age 35. He wrote the piece not for the celeste, of course, but for an unusual instrument that was the specialty of a virtuoso named Marianne Kirchgesner. The instrument was called the harmonica. It was invented by none other than Benjamin Franklin in the 1760s, and it was so popular in the 18th and 19th centuries before it fell out of favor that something like 300 pieces of music were written for it. The instrument is better known today as the glass harmonica. Not harmonica as in mouth harp. The glass harmonica is an instrument made up of custom blown stemless glasses, nested and stacked sideways, arranged by size from small to large. And the whole set of glasses is mounted on an iron spindle. The glass harmonica player touches the edges of the rotating glasses with water moistened fingers and just the right amount of pressure produces a hauntingly pure tone. You can imagine the sound that the glass harmonica produces if you've ever run your finger around the edge of a wine or water glass to generate a musical tone. With relatively few um, glass harmonica virtuosos on hand today to perform the music written for this instrument, Modern performances of music originally composed for the glass harmonica often substitute other instruments such as the celeste. The first section of Mozart's piece is marked adagio, indicating that the first movement should be played slowly. The second section is a rondo, a conventional musical form in which the musical theme presented at the beginning of the movement returns several times and contrasting musical episodes are interspersed between these returns of the main theme.
In the last piece on the program, we return to the 21st century. This is not the first time that Michael is playing the bright motion in this hall. In fact, he recorded this piece, which was written for him by the composer Mark Danzigers in 2011, in this hall and on this very piano. The bright motion, like John Luther Adams' Nuna Tax, asks us to listen with a different mindset than that which we might bring to some of the other pieces on the program today. It is expansive music. Musical gestures and motives repeat many times. The piece unfolds slowly over the course of about 11 minutes. While Nuna Tox emphasizes silence and open space, in Danziger's piece, the music is meditative, but also active, busy, constantly ascending. The bright motion. <laughs> 